most likely find out about them in two passages in the Old Testament, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, where it's talking about two people uh, that lived at that time, the, king of, uh, the prince of Tyre and the king of Babylon. And, there's, and God used the prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah to speak against them, but then he started speaking of someone, unless it's very symbolic, of someone who has nothing to do with the literal king of Babylon or the prince of Tyre at that time. It sounds like some heavenly personage. And it's um, understood in a lot of circles, and I believe this, it's referring to this being, this personal being who eventually became the devil. Now, one thing, we, we get questions all the time on the radio. We also do the radio show, Pastor's Perspective, probably many of you listen to that. Well, people say, well, why'd God create the devil? Well, he didn't. He did not create the devil. He created a supernatural being, and he wasn't an angel, by the way. He was a cherub. The cherub is the highest form of created being, probably the highest form of being that God ever created. And at a particular time, this cherub decided to rebel against God and bring in another will into the universe. Uh, Ezekiel 28 tells us five times. He said, I will ascend to the highest. I will do this. I will do that. Until that time, there was only one will in the universe, and that was God's will. When this being brought a different will into the universe apart from God, he became Satan or the adversary. That's what the term Satan means, or the devil, the slanderer. And so when we talk about Satan or the devil, it's a personal being that God created who became this by his rebellion against God sometime in the distant past. Now, from the scripture, we learn that he took about a third of the angels with him when he rebelled against God. And so we have this personage there who is pure evil. Jesus said he was a murderer at the beginning, John 8, 44. He's the, a liar and the father of all lies. And so he is there trying to destroy you and I. And so we want to understand what the Bible has to say about him. He does indeed exist. He is, not, he is a personal being. He's never described as some type of impersonal force or symbol of evil. In fact, Jesus had a dialogue with him. You don't dialogue with a, you know, a non-person um, or some symbol. It's clear the Lord was not having a discussion with some particular symbol. So we also find conversations in the book of Job. The first chapter of the book of Job, fascinating that seemingly this being has some type of, uh, you know, entrance. He can make, he came in front of the presence of the Lord. He has some type limited entrance to the presence of God, and Job records that. And God there has a conversation with this being, Satan at that particular time, as he's called. Personal pronouns of you are used about him. He's called he, you, himself, attributed to the devil, so the consistent idea of scripture is that we're dealing with a personal being, not a force, not some type of a symbol, but actually an evil personal being. Now, this talk, what we're doing tonight, kind of piggybacks with a couple of things I've done on Christian living and on uh, winning the spiritual war. We're in a battle. We're trying to live for Christ. We're all trying to do it, but we're getting slaughtered and slammed and beaten up on all sides. And tonight, we're going to find out some of the methods the enemy uses so we can be aware of them, be prepared when they happen. So when they happen, it's not like we're taken by surprise. See, the, um, many years ago, I remember when I was first a Christian, I read a book on Satan. By him. I was reading on every particular subject going by Lewis Berry Chafer, the former head of Dallas Theological Seminary. And he said something that I never, I never would have dreamed of or thought of, but it's true. He said, you know, Satan's masterpiece is not the person living in the gutter, the drunk and that, the, the homeless person. Satan's masterpiece is the guy living on the bluff, got everything going, life is good, he's got enough money, more than he needs. In other words, he doesn't feel he needs anything. The person in the gutter feels they need things, and they, you know, they will look around for, you know, for an answer. And that's where the Lord Jesus Christ will come in. But Satan's masterpiece is making people feel they're secure in their own way. Whatever it does, he wants to keep us in spiritual darkness. So there's actually two subjects here. Uh, we don't have time to get in both of them. One is how does he keep unbelievers in spiritual darkness? And he does that many ways. There's about 10 points out of that. We're not going to go into that tonight. But, you know, by denying his existence of, uh, you know, he comes as an angel of light, fooling them, uh, thinking that uh, anything having to do with him is just mythology and just making people feel that there's no such thing as a personal devil. Anybody believes in that as some type of Neanderthal all the day. But anyway, there's a lot of reasons how he keeps unbelievers in spiritual darkness. But what we want to look at tonight, all right, 
What methods does he use to us, believers in Jesus? What is he doing uh, to try and keep us from being the person God would have us to be? Now remember, his goal is to lead people away from the person of Jesus Christ. He will do whatever he can to accomplish this goal. He does not want people to believe in Christ. But as we're a testimony tonight, he has miserably failed, hasn't he? Because we're here as a testimony he did not win in our lives. He did not win. The Lord Jesus got us, and we're here, and there's millions upon millions of people around the world who have put their faith in the living Christ. And so he's failed on that end. But what he wants to do, all right, now even though he's failed, you know, we're, we're with Christ, he wants to keep us from being that type of person that God would have us to be. In other words, we're part of the family of God, but that doesn't stop the devil from trying to lead us astray from serving the Lord. Consequently, from Scripture, we find that believers are warned about him because he is still harassing us. I'm sure we all are aware of that, right? I'm not talking to anybody that we know. Okay, you know what I'm talking? Okay, good. I'm glad we're all, we're all in the same. He is just harassing us. 1 Peter 5.8, it says, uh, be sober, watch, be watching. Your adversary, the devil, it goes around like a... Uh, um, roaring lion, what is he doing? He goes around seeking who may he may devour. So what we find from Scripture, and Scripture, again, is our, our textbook, our battle plan, how he deals with us and how we should respond to him. I remember when I was in uh, college, I had to take these courses, went to a secular college, take a philosophy class uh, and a world religion class just to get the, enough credits, you know, for, as an undergraduate. And um, I remember in the philosophy class, uh, the professor who'd written a book on philosophy, by the way, a textbook, and he, he made this statement. He said the problem, and he quoted this optimistic philosopher named Buckminster Fuller. He said the problem with this protoplasmic experiment, that is human beings, we don't have an instruction manual. We don't know how we're supposed to work. We don't know, you know, we're here, but how, what are we supposed to do? Well, we do have an instruction manual. Tonight we're going to go to the manual, and if we obey the manual, if we listen to it, we won't get in trouble. Okay, let's look at the, go down the list. Number one, he tempts people with evil. Number one, he tempts people with evil. This is one of the ways he works towards Christians. Uh, this is not surprising since we find, found out in the beginning, what did he do with Jesus? Well, he tempted him. All right, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 to 10, we read about the devil tempting Jesus in the following way. It said, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Matthew 4, 8 to 10. Interesting, and the three temptations that Jesus had that are recorded for us, each time he answered with scripture, which is a very good lesson for each and every one of us, why we want to memorize scripture and remember where it is. When I quote a passage, I not only want to quote it, I want to quote the address too, you know, not just, well, the Bible says somewhere, I don't know where it is, it's kind of, you know, somewhere in there. No, it's good if we know the address, where it is, so we can quote it and, and cite it. What's fascinating about this in Jesus' temptation, three times he was, you know, we, we recorded the devil, you know, tempted in different ways, and three times he quoted scripture, and three times it was the same Old Testament book, the second law or the book of Deuteronomy. And it's interesting, in the 18th century, uh, 17th century, the first uh, attack against the history of the Old Testament was against what book? The book of Deuteronomy, showing that <laughs> Satan never got over it, I guess, trying to show it wasn't reliable, wasn't trustworthy, saying that Moses didn't really write it, it was written much later. So anyway, Jesus quotes scripture. So here's our first thing we want to think. All right, if he tempted Jesus, he's probably certainly going to tempt us, right? Well, he is. And since only the God of the Bible is to be worshipped, it would be a sin to bow down to the devil, so Jesus refused to. Now, probably all of us are going to say, well, look, I'm not going to bow down to the devil. I'm not going to, you know, serve and bow down to him. There's no way you're going to do that. I'm not going to worship him directly. Well, no, probably not. But you know what? He kind of gets us indirectly in ways we don't expect. I um, did a book called uh, Does the God of the Bible Exist? And one of the points we make in that book the difference between practical atheists and theoretical atheists. And there's a real distinction there, and let me explain what it is. A 
a theoretical atheist is someone who says, I don't believe God exists. You know, I don't believe there is a God. I don't have any God beliefs. Of course, that's the fallacy of categorical denial. How do you know there's no God that exists? How do you believe that? You know, the only way you could make such a statement like that, if you know saying there is no God, if you knew everything in the universe, every inch of it, everything seen and unseen, everywhere, beyond every planet, that's the only way you could make a statement that said there is no God. God doesn't exist. And if you had that knowledge, you'd be God. So that kind of kills that argument, as it were. But the idea is... Uh, these are theoretical atheists, but we have what is called as practical atheists. And here's what we got to be careful, gang. Practical atheists uh, say, I believe in God, I believe he exists, but they don't live as though he exists. How many people do you know who claim to be Christians live as though there's no God? They live as though God does not exist, that he's not going to, uh, you know, there's not going to be a day they're going to stand before him. In other words, they believe theoretically that they're not a theoretical atheist, but they're a practical atheist. They're really living in such a way that God does not exist. So we've got to be really, really careful when we say, I believe in God. Well, do we, we live it? I remember many years ago, in fact, it was, it was funny. You know, something things, you remember where it happened, where it happened? I was actually driving not too far from here on the 91. I remember this years and years ago, listening to the radio. And it was the late Paul Harvey. It wasn't late then, obviously, because he's on the radio live. He's given this broadcast, and he... And, um, he said that somebody's collecting a book, famous sayings or favorite sayings from famous people. And he, and he was quoting some of them, some were really cute, really funny. And he, and he said something that really caught my eye here. And I thought it was so, so profound. He said, there is a saying that guides my life. This saying is the first thing I see in the morning because I have it in a, pla a big a, a, a plaque, as it were, above my bed in big, big letters. When I go to work every day, you know, it's there at my desk. It's the last thing I see before I go to sleep at night. Again, first thing I see every morning right in front of me. And the little saying goes like this, if you don't live it, you don't believe it. If you don't live it, you don't believe it. And I like that. And so we, you know, Satan tempts us with evil thinking, well, I'd never fall for that. Well, maybe not theoretically, but do we practically fall for something like that? I'm afraid so. And so we've got to be careful about that, this tactic of Satan. In uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, he says, that is why I could bear it no longer. This is Paul speaking. I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. I was afraid that the tempter, that is another term for Satan, had gotten the best of you, and that all our work had been useless. Now, this letter was written to believers in Jesus Christ. Paul warned them about the work of the tempter. He tries to get us to do evil. This is one of his methods. We need to be aware of that. And again, doing evil sometimes is living as though God does not exist. That is evil. Now, there's an interesting um, situation that I remember reading about. A rabbi in Jesus' day had uh, talking about God's, you know, superintendence, the way he watches over uh, the people in the world. And he came up with a really interesting um, analogy here. He said, uh, when it comes to penalizing, if someone is a strong-armed robber, let's say someone, you know, you're in the road and you're, you, you, you rob somebody, you take them at broad daylight, you rob them and you, and you, you know, leave with, with their goods, you steal, you know, their livelihood or whatever it might be. He said, that's one thing. But he said, a thief who sneaks into people's houses, a thief who sneaks into people's houses and steals ought to get twice the punishment of a strong-armed robber. And someone thinks, why is that? Why should someone who sneaks in someone's house should get the punishment twice of us as a strong-armed robber? You know what he said? It's because the thief is doing it thinking nobody's watching. So what are they doing? They're basically saying, I don't believe there's a God who's, watch, who's watching and seeing what I'm doing. And I thought the rabbi had some really great wisdom there saying, they ought to get twice the punishment because they thought not only no human saw me, there's no supernatural being to see me. Anyway, uh, he tempts us with doing evil. Now, here is the good news in all this. This is a verse I'm sure many of you have underlined in your Bible. If not, you should. Uh, one that is a great promise. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No trial has overtaken you that is not faced by others. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tried beyond what you are able to bear. But with the trial, he will provide a way out so you may be able to endure it. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. He always provides a way out. We will be tested. We will be tempted. But he always provides a way of escape. I can't tell you how many times I've claimed that verse saying, Lord, 
you pr promise to provide a way out with it, any testing or temptation that goes on in my life. Uh, where is it, you know? Uh, well, it's there. It's not always in our timing, though. You ever notice that, that God's timing is not the same as ours? But bottom line is, first thing the enemy wants to do is try to get us to, to do evil. And evil can sometimes be not doing the wrong thing, but not doing the right thing, just by, you know, not doing what we should be doing. Okay, number two, he inspires wicked thoughts. The Bible teaches that Satan inspires evil thoughts. We find an example of this in the book of Acts, where Scripture records the sin, the married couple, the famous Ananias and Sapphira. Peter said to the man Ananias that Satan had caused him to lie to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5 and verse 3, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart so you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you receive uh, for the land? Now notice, it was Satan who filled the heart of this believer. He and that Sapphira's wife, they were believers in Jesus. Uh, Ananias had to take the time to think about how he's going to lie to the Christians. These evil thoughts were inspired by Satan. Unfortunately, Ananias acted upon them. Evil ideas do come in the minds of believers. Yes, they do. And so the question we have to ask ourselves, what's going on in our mind? Where do these evil ideas come from? What are we listening to? What are we reading? What are we watching? Um, you know, if we're watching things that are evil all the time or listening to things or reading about things, um, well, possibly we'll act some of these things out. And so it does have an effect. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to walk out on something, turn something off. You know, uh, uh, sometimes I remember, you know, you want to rent a movie at night and you watch it and after about two minutes you're thinking, uh, 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 this is going in the circular file and you turn it off. You know, you, even though you might have paid for it, you think it sounded interesting, but no, I'm not going to fill my mind with that kind of junk. So this is the opposite of what God wants us to think about. Now listen to what he says in Philippians 4.8 what our thoughts should be centered on. Finally, brothers and sisters, keep your thoughts on whatever is right or deserves praise, things that are true, honorable, fair, pure, acceptable, or commendable. Philippians 4.8. That's from the translation God's Word. The New Living Translation says, And now, dear brothers and sisters, let me say one more thing as I close this letter. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about those things that are pure, lovely, and admirable. Think about those things that are excellent and worthy of praise. All right, Satan is able, what he's able to do is to put thoughts in our head or wicked thoughts in the mind of believers. The Lord wants us to think on godly things. Ultimately, who chooses? It's us. We choose what we'll think about, whether we want to think about and dwell upon good things or evil things. Good thoughts or evil thoughts. Now, you can't help it, obviously, in the world we live, when evil things come across your path, you hear things or see things, to, you know, that you can't help. But dwelling on them is really the issue here. So we want to be careful. When thoughts like this or evil things come across, we don't want to dwell on them. Ananias and his wife Sapphira, what they did, uh, they, they had to think about this, how to put a plot together, not only to lie to the apostle, but to lie to the people that they sold a the land for a certain price. And, uh, you know, it wasn't like it just was spur of the moment. This is like murder one, premeditated here. And God says, no, no, this is inspired by Satan, as scripture tells us in Acts chapter 5, verse 3. We don't want to plot those things. Number three, and this is one we're all very well aware of, he opposes those who are in God's service. Satan opposes those who are in God's service. The devil is opposed to everything that is good, but he's particularly interested in opposing those of us who are trying to serve the Lord. Now, let me, let me just say this very clearly. This is something I never forget that I heard John MacArthur say when he came, uh, when I was going to Bible college in the early 70s. He came and he said, look, you might not all be full-time ministers or full-time preachers, but you're all full-time Christians. And whatever you are, that's your full-time job as a believer in Jesus. And so this refers to all of us. Don't just think, well, this talks, you know, it's Pastor Bob or, or somebody else, uh, you know, that it refers to is not me. No, it is you. You're in God's service if you're a Christian. He opposes those who are serving the Lord. In other words, if you're serving the Lord, you're really going to get it from the enemy. Paul testified to the Thessalonians that Satan attempted to hinder him uh, when he was going to Thessalonica. He said, before we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. In this instance, somehow, some way, 
he, tr- he stopped temporarily the work of the Lord in Paul's life from visiting the church. His tactics are the same today. He wants to do what he can to keep the work of the Lord from going forward. What could that mean? It could mean sickness, disillusionment, um, the such like. I remember the times in my life when I was a, a young believer in Jesus, and I really wanted to serve the Lord, but there were, there were certain times that was time for church and everything seemingly was going wrong. And I think it, you know, just, this just isn't a good night to go to church. But then we have to go by not what we feel, but what we know, right? I thought, you know, I think probably above any night, this is probably the night I should go. Let me tell you something. Whenever I did that, when I didn't feel like it, I had a blessing above and beyond anything I can imagine. I was so glad I took the time to go there and hear the word of God at that particular time because not only I needed to hear it, God had something special for me. But Satan uses things, throws things in the way to keep us from serving the Lord, uh, keep us from doing the work of the ministry. And so, um, go, you know, we don't want that. We need to be aware that's what he's trying to do. Anything, you know, to try and hinder us from doing God's work. Now, number four is something, again, all of us are very painfully, painfully aware of what he does. He makes accusations against God's people, and that's you and I. He makes accusations against us. This is one of the ways he hinders us in our work for the Lord. In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side to do what? to accuse him, to accuse him. Here we find Satan is the accuser of the people of God. Now this verse is is, is further developed, this thought, this truth in the New Testament where people are constantly accused by this evil being. In Revelation 12, 10, we're told this. It says, then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has happened at last, the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser has been thrown down to earth, the one who accused our brothers and sisters before our God day and night. He accuses you and I day and night. And so one of the things he does is make accusations against God's people. Fortunately, we have what the Bible says, an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John 2, 1 and 2 says, My children, these things I write to you that you do not sin, but if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the the righteous. In other words, he is the one that speaks for us. Now, making accusations. Now, let's be honest. When Satan makes accusations against us, they're not all false, are they? Sometimes they're true. Sometimes we've done things we're guilty of. But that's why we go to Jesus. That's why we come to him. We confess our sins as we read. We have an advocate with the Father. An advocate is like a defense attorney who pleads our case with God the Father. And I always love to tell this illustration. Years and years ago, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Adrian Rogers. He was the pastor. He's now with the Lord. He was the pastor at the time of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. And it was Easter time, 1977, uh, where I was uh, working with Josh McDowell at the time. We went and Josh spoke uh, on an evening service there at the church and got to meet Dr. Uh, Adrian Rogers. And I, I, it's hard to explain this man. Here's, here's how I can best explain him. When I saw him, he reminds me of someone who had just been around the corner talking with Jesus, and now he comes to our presence. I mean, the man had, he just glowed with the presence of the Lord. I was trying to get close to him and kind of let someone rub off on me. You know, I'm this new Christian guy. I want, I want some of the glow to rub off. But anyway... He tells the story that oftentimes when he speaks, Satan starts whispering in his ear, Adrian Rogers, how dare you get up and speak? I know who you are. You know who you are. You're a sinner. If the people know what you are like, they wouldn't listen to you. And on and on and on and on. And possibly you've had that happen. Uh, You're getting ready to go to church. You want to go to church? Do the people there really know what you're like? If they knew what you're like, they'd move away from They wouldn't even talk to you. And you hear that sort of thing. So anyway, Adrian Rogers is talking about that. This happens to him before he goes out to speak. And he says, every time that happens, I just say one thing. Satan, see my attorney. Yeah. And what he's saying by that, we have an advocate, someone pleading our case with God, the Father, the Lord Jesus. Yes, we do sin, but we confess our sins and we go forward. We go on. We don't wallow in them. We don't let Satan beat us down. We don't, you know, sit there and think about him. So we're worthless for a day or two or whatever it might be. He's accusing us all the time. He's, he's trying to accuse us to keep us from going forward. Yes, we are guilty 
yes, we are sinners. Yes, we make mistakes. Sometimes, you know, it's bad enough we get caught for doing what we do, but sometimes we get accusation of things we didn't do. And what do you do about those things? Um, you know, that's tough. Do you defend yourself? Uh, I've found in life you just kind of go on and just let things take care of themselves. I love what J. Vernon McGee said. He said, you can't stop people from talking about you, but you can sure make a liar out of them the way that you live. And I like that. You just live consistently for the Lord. Let people, you know, flap their mouths about you if they want to. That's, that's their business, but uh, we go on. But he, he makes accusations against God's people, and unfortunately it comes from others. And sometimes it comes from fellow Christians, which really, really, really hurts. And uh, so this is how he uses Satan. Satan, how he uses others against us. Unbelievers, believers making accusations. Number five, he intimidates God's people. He is intim an intimidator. And this is a verse we read earlier about he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking for someone who may, he may devour. He wants to intimidate people from doing that which is right. And let me tell you, if there is an ever an age and ever a time when we're seeing this, it's certainly right now. Trying to intimidate us from, from not being that Christian, that Christian, you know, on the job, around the neighborhood, at home, or wherever it might be. Um, we need to be alert because Satan is a bully. He's trying to bully us to do the wrong thing. And we don't want to be intimidated by this evil creature who is constantly, according to 1 Peter 5, 8, constantly want to devour us, constantly want to eat us alive. Jesus has been victorious over the devil. He is constantly watching over us. Now, fear of the devil is unwarranted. We don't fear him, but we do want to have a healthy respect for him. In Jude 9, we're told this, Michael the archangel did not himself take the devil on one-on-one, -on -one, but he got the Lord in between them. He said, the Lord rebuke you. And this is when they're disputing over the body of Moses. So please listen carefully to this. When you feel an attack by the enemy, you always want the Lord between you and the enemy. You don't say, I rebuke you. No, no, no. You don't rebuke anybody. The Lord's got to do this. It's got to be the Lord that does this. We've got to be very careful to somehow think that we are going to be the ones that can rebuke the, uh, the enemy. Um, we can't, but we can rebuke them through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no strength in among ourselves. So we need a healthy respect for him. Now, the problem is in something like this, though, uh, intimidation. Some of the intimidation today is speaking out the truth. People are silent. Christians are silent. And we need to speak up, gang, particularly in this day and age, as the world is seemingly going to hell in a handbasket uh, more and more each day. There is a story I read. One of the um, talk, in fact, it was, I think, at the end of the program yesterday, I was uh, talking about this for the last five or ten minutes or so. It's a, it was a survey that came out. And says half of the pastors, this is in the United States of America, half of the pastors are afraid to speak on certain issues because they're afraid it might offend somebody. It might offend somebody. I'm thinking, you got to be kidding me. It might offend somebody. Don't you think the gospel is a little bit offensive? You're a sinner. You're going to hell unless you believe in Jesus, that you can't make it on your own no matter how good you are. You're not good enough. But we need people. We need people, not just pastors, but Christians who are willing to speak out and speak the truth on certain matters. Now, it comes at a price. Not everybody's going to be your friend. It costs, but it's the right thing to do. And God will honor that. Uh, 1 Samuel 20, 28 says, you know, you honor him, he will honor you. The idea is that, uh, 28, 20, excuse me, you honor him, he will honor you. The idea behind this is just basically that if you honor the Lord with your life and speak the truth and take a stand, he will honor you. Uh, there's a situation I have with someone I know very well, and um, it, it's interesting. You ever, you ever have a, one, a situation where there's someone you really care about, you love, and they love you, here comes the but, but they think this is right and you know what they're doing is wrong, and you think, well, you know, maybe I can just kind of, you know, not take a stand for it. No, no. We need to be respected by people. They may not like what we do. They may not like what we're saying, but we've got to be consistent. We want to earn their respect by sticking with the word of God. We don't want to be afraid that people might not like us. People might, might you know, get mad at us or call us names or something like that. Uh, we shouldn't be concerned about offending someone. Now, two things here. The message will offend, but hopefully what's not offensive is us, our attitude or how we do it. Someone called the radio, what was it, uh, a couple of days ago and said, uh, 
Uh, yeah, it was a guy two days ago, uh, yesterday. The guy said, uh, my wife doesn't like me preaching the gospel. She don't like me go, going out with me because I preach the gospel to everybody. And she said it always calls a problem. And so the question was, well, wait a minute now. Is it the message that you're giving is offended, offending people? Or are you the offender by just doing it in such a way it's offensive to people? All of us have seen, I'm sure that we've, we've had, it's been cringeworthy, the cringing, right? When there's somebody trying to preach the gospel to people and it's offensive. No one's listening to them whatsoever. And it's very offensive to everybody. It's not the right way to do it. The message is fine, but we don't want to deliver it in an offensive way. So we have to ask ourselves the question. We do need to stand up for Christ. We do need to preach the gospel, but we want to do it in a way that it'll be the message that offends, offends not our lousy behavior. Okay, number six, he seduces believers to sin. Satan and his craftiness can seduce believers to sin. Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by its cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 11.3. Boy, this is, this is fascinating. This is, the mark, this is one of the passages we talk about in the mark of a cult. Uh, certain non-Christian cults seduce people into believing the wrong thing about God. I'm thinking particularly of the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, or the Jehovah's Witnesses. They seduce people into thinking what they got is the, is the truth. And you keep reading this passage, and Paul says, you know, there's another Jesus out there that's being preached, another gospel, another Holy Spirit. There's a false apostles that have nothing to do with the biblical Jesus, the biblical gospel, but they're seducing people because they're telling people what they want to hear. Now, the gospel is not what most people want to hear. They don't want to hear they're sinners. They don't want to hear they can't make it on their own. They don't want to hear that they're not good enough in God's presence. They want to hear everything's right. Everything's right with the world. Everybody's going to heaven someday, and so there's nothing to worry about. Let's just move on to the next uh, thing. No, we, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 11.3, we can be led astray with our pure devotion to Christ as the serpent deceived Eve. Deceptions there. All right. We all have our weaknesses. Let's face it, we do. The key is to know what they are because Satan knows what they are and he's going to attempt to ex ex exploit them, as it were. We have our weaknesses and uh, we all indeed have them. So we've got to know what they are, not try and fool ourselves, thinking, well, I'm strong in this area. Well, maybe you are, but if you're not, don't pretend you're strong in something that you're not. 1 Corinthians 10 12 says, Anybody that thinks they stand better take heed lest they fall. The perfect illustration of this that I always think of is a movie that was on, uh, boy, it shows I'm getting old, many, many years ago. It was called The Sting. Some of you might have seen the movie. It was, uh, Robert Redford and Paul Newman. It was set in like the 1920s, as it were. And there were two kind of low-level con artists in this movie. And one of their friends, they conned this person. Uh, they got uh, some money from this guy, but the person they conned was actually a member of the mob, one of their friends, Luther. And Luther gets killed because it was the mob, that, you know, it was money they took. And so, uh, and they didn't know it was the mob. They wouldn't have done that if they would have known that. So what they're going to do, they have to play a con on the guy who caused the death of their friend Luther. So I'll never forget one of the great lines to me in movie history is when Paul Newman and Robert Redford, for the first time, see the person. He's the, quote, Mark. He's the one we're going to con here. And I'll never forget the, line, the dialogue that's going on. Robert Redford looks at Paul Newman and his character says, he looks at him, He's not as tough as he thinks he is. And Paul Newman looks at him and says, neither are we. Um, I think we need to understand that we're not as tough as we think we are. We are not. And we've got to understand that we all have weaknesses. We all have, you know, weaknesses which we can fall with. We, know what are, we need to know our strengths. We need to know our weaknesses. We need to understand them and not put ourselves in a position where our weakness will become, you know, um, a sh uh, shown. Uh, an example that so many times people who have a weakness, a weakness with money, and they end up being in a situation where they handle funds. And I can't tell you how many times over the years there have been people, pastors that tell me they've got this terrible thing that's happened in their church that someone who was in charge of the money decided just to take it for themselves. I can think of uh, two of them right now. One, in fact, was a church was, my wife and I were just at a couple weeks ago. He said it was one uh, Sunday and uh, he goes in to look at, you know, at the money that's there for the church, and they're missing the monthly payment of $7,000. That's what they were paying. That was the rent on the church. 
And it, come, it turned out that the guy that was the assistant pastor just took the money and pocketed it in his own pocket and took and stole it from the church. And eventually, he, you know, obviously he's not in the ministry anymore. He did a lot more things than that. But he said, fortunately, in God's grace, the person who, who the landlord, gave us a, a, a free pass for the whole month when we told him the story. He said, no, we're not going to charge this month. You're great tenants, great payers, and that. But it was terrible. I know another pastor that's, uh, you know, not too far distance from here in the church, a very good friend of mine, who told me they caught a guy, you know, going through, you know, they have the, the offering boxes all over the church. One time when the church was empty, they see this guy going in all the boxes, taking the money, stuffing his pocket, stuffing a briefcase, just stealing from him. Well, uh, obviously, the guy had, you know, they had problems there. They had to get rid of him. And so he never should have been in a position, if he know, knew that or if it was a temptation, that that's something they ought to uh, do. And so the idea is he got seduced to sin, and he did sin. That was one of his weaknesses. So what if your weakness is? Uh, you know, understand what it is. All right. Now, number seven, he diverts people from God's truth. He diverts people from God's truth. All right. Now, this is the one here that... Um, over the years, I've talked about this a lot. I'll, I'll explain what I'm doing in a second here. He wants to have believers thinking on temporal things, temporal things, things of this world, not the eternal things. In other words, things that are happening right now. Paul encourages to people to set their minds on the things eternal. He wrote to the Corinthians about seeking the things that are above that will last forever. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For our present troubles are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably greater glory that will last forever. That's the troubles we're going through right now. So don't look at the troubles we can see right now. Rather look forward to what we have not seen. For the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. In other words, look at the big picture. Look down the line for eternity, the goal that will all be in the presence of the Lord. So as we're going through these trials, keep your eye on the prize, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. This is very important we do this. Now, what is one of the methods of the devil? He wants to divert people from this truth of the Lord. If he can get us to think of meaningless things that take place in this world, then he's accomplishing his task. This one thing is particularly troublesome, back what we said earlier, living as though God does not exist, being that uh, practical atheist, not the theoretical atheist. No, of course I believe in God. I believe he exists. No, no. But you don't live that way. Now, one of the issues over the years, I've spoke on this a number of times. In the early 80s, I wrote a book on the, on the occult, understanding the occult. And one of the things, conclusions I came from is this, because people ask us all the time, get on the radio, I've had them ask them so often when I'm speaking, something happened to them, something it seemed was supernatural, some type of supernatural event, some type of event may have been demonic, and they want to know what the source was. And here is my answer always. People that dabble in the occult, uh, whether the source is demonic or it is not, it still accomplishes the same thing. One of the things I discovered is most of the things that go on in the area of the occult are nothing but, uh, you know, they're, 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 people are charlatans, it's not really occultists, they don't believe it. They know how to trick people, sleight of hand, uh, people are gullible, how to fool them, as it were. I, wrote a, I read a book that was called The Psychic Mafia, and the guy was exposing some of the secrets, he says, because his psychics they kind of have a little mafia going on, because the same people go to see all of them, and so they share information about each other, and they share some of the tricks of the trade, as it were. But here's the thing. Whether it's Satan actually working something demonic, or you think it's demonic, it accomplishes the same thing. You don't, you know, it's, it puts you in neutral, or you go backwards, you don't follow the Lord. So to try and determine where it came from many times is not really should be the issue. The issue is how to, you know, move on from something like this. It's kind of like the Buddhist proverb. If someone shoots an arrow in your back, you're more concerned about getting it out than finding out where it came from, right? In other words, let's deal with the problem as it is. Whether it came where it's demonic, where someone's fooling you, whatever it might be, Satan wants to divert us from the truth. Whatever he can use to get us off on a tangent, he will do that. All right. Number eight, he gets believers to compromise. The Bible says Satan attempts to get believers in Jesus Christ to compromise their convictions, something we should never do. Uh, Jesus made it clear we can only have one master, as it were. We follow the words in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 24. 
No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Matthew 6, 24. The enemy wants believers to compromise the things of God. Indeed, he does not want us to take a stand for Jesus. Now, compromise can come in many different flavors, many different signs, sizes, but one of them, again, is back to the area of money, of compromising that. Uh, we're going to, you know, that God, Jesus said you can't serve God and wealth. You've got to make the decision. Who am I going to serve in this life? And so uh, it could be a belief system. I have a belief system that I, I hold to. I'm going to serve it, and I don't care what. I'm going to compromise, and when we compromise, we pay the price for it. Just, just trust God, believe in him, and watch what he does. Now, I'm going to end with this one tonight. Number nine, he places doubts in the minds of believers. Doubts in the minds of believers. Satan has done that from the very beginning. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, uh, now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? In other words, he placed doubt in the mind of the woman that God had the best in mind for. Doubt will hinder us from believing uh, in the Lord, be effective for his service. It will keep us from following the Lord in the manner that we should. Remember, it is Satan who put doubts in the mind about the goodness of God. Now, this is a confession I'm going to make here. Now, I'm doing this for a reason. This was a problem I had for many years as a young believer in Jesus. I had doubts about the truthfulness of the Christian faith, and the enemy would pound me with those, pound me with them. Do I really believe it's true? What if it's just nonsense? What if I'm fooling myself? And let me tell you, it was a real, real struggle at times that I thought I was going to give up. But see, here's what happened. This is why I want to encourage you. Whatever things we talked about tonight, whatever if issues, let me tell you what happened with me. My greatest weakness became my greatest strength because God showed me not only there's no reason to doubt, once I got into the field of apologetics, defending the Christian faith, looking at the evidence for it, and particularly what I do now, like with his channel and talk about the evidence for the Christian faith or what's going on in the world today, the 25 signs were near the end and all that. All doubts have long gone. I haven't had doubts for you know, decades now because once I looked into the facts, once I look into the evidence, you know, there's no way you can doubt when you see the totality of, of the truth that God's there. But the point I'm making is it's in, in, in my life, in my testimony, no matter what the problem is, God can turn your greatest weakness into your strongest point, into your strength, if you let him do it. And that's what he did for me, and I'm a living testimony of that. It's what I do. I give evidence for the Christian faith, as we do on the radio program, on the TV programs, and the such like, reasons of what we believe and why we believe it. But for years and years, the first few years as a Christian, I didn't know if I was going to make it. I didn't really know if I, if I was going to you know, stay the course, as it were, because of the doubts that I had. And Satan was putting those doubts in my mind. There were times I just threw the Bible across the room, thinking, I don't know, I don't believe this stuff. But then, as I started to look in to the evidence for the Christian faith, the evidence that Jesus Christ is whom he claimed to be, predicted prophecy, fulfilled prophecy, the miracles of Christ, what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. I saw that it's true. And now, if you watch, if you ever watch the program, again, if you can't watch it live, you can watch it on video on demand. We do on his channel. I can almost say every day, you can't make this stuff up, how it's falling into place so precisely. That was predicted some, uh, you know, anywhere from 2,600 years ago to 3,000 years ago, what the world be like at the time of the end. Voila, here it is, right in front of our very eyes. How do we know this stuff? We know it because the Bible predicts it. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a son of a prophet, but I can tell you what's going to happen. Not because I say so, but because the Bible says so. And time after time after time, and I could give you examples as long as my arm, because, but uh, I would encourage you, since I spend four hours a week doing it on television, you might want to watch some of those because I can go into greater detail. And then we have the Focus Point program. We spend a whole hour focusing on one or two issues like that to develop it in detail to show that we're not believing by blind faith. We're not assassinating our brains to be a Christian. But the bottom line tonight is this, gang. Satan is trying to keep us from serving the Lord. He's trying to keep us from being that person that God would want us to be. We can't let him do it. We should not let him do it. And if we know our enemy, we know our adversary, we know him ahead of time, then we can, you know, cut him off at the pass, as it were, by trusting the word of God 
and quoting the scriptures and believing what God has said. So tonight, whatever you're struggling with, whatever Satan is trying to do in your life to keep you from walking the straight and narrow, remember, you don't have to listen to him. He is a defeated foe. Christ Jesus won the victory. He said on Calvary's cross, it is finished. That's your salvation and mine. So let's walk in it and let's rest in it. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you very much that we are warned about this cunning enemy that we all face, the devil. We thank you, Lord, that you have had victory over him. But we all confess, Lord, he has had victory over us too many times in our own life. We don't want that to continue to happen. Dear God, please give us the wisdom, the strength to fight the fight of faith, to put on the, you know, up the shield of faith, the whole armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, to be that person you would have us to be, to, to stand for you, Lord, and not to compromise our convictions, not to let Satan push us around, not to intimidate us, but to make a stand for the Lord Jesus, wherever it might be. And we just ask you to give us the strength and whatever the weakness we might have tonight, whatever the problem we might all be facing, we all are facing things, would you help us turn that into our greatest strength, even though it seems to be an impossible victory to have? I thank you. I'm a testimony of that. And I pray that others tonight would realize that whatever they're going through, whatever their weakness is, you can make it their greatest strength if they're willing to trust you. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless you guys. On behalf of our pastors and staff, we want to thank you for tuning in to today's video. If you want to stay informed about what's going on here at Calvary Chapel East Anaheim, we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel. Go ahead and do so by clicking the button below. We'll see you next time.